Good evening. Thanks, Hazel, and good evening, one. Well, welcome to uh, ASIO and the Ben Shifley Building and my annual threat assessment. I'd like to start by recognising our partners and uh, colleagues represented in the uh, here tonight. Your Excellencies, members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence Security, Inspector General, Directors General, uh, Military Chiefs, Vice Chief, Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, David Irvin, former Director General of Security and other guises, but David, great to see you here this evening as well. Can I start with an admission? While I'm pleased to host you and pleased to host an event like this um, and invite you into the Ben Chifley building, a lectern is not really my happy place. Like many of you, I suspect, I loathe public speaking. So you might be wondering why someone like me would choose to do something like this. In fact, I was thinking that very thing, standing there watching that video. <laughs> but there are three key reasons, and I'd like to explain them. The first is trust. ASIO protects Australia and Australians from threats to their security. Our ability to deliver our mission requires us to maintain the trust and confidence of our stakeholders, including the Australian people. A vibrant and liberal democracy requires a security service that is transparent and trusted. I believe this imposes a responsibility on ASIO to be as open as possible about what the organisation does and why we do it. Giving this address and inviting you into our building is a tangible expression of how seriously I take that responsibility. It's why I was one of the first intelligence leaders anywhere in the world to have a personally identifiable Twitter account. Followers, please welcome. It's why I do occasional speeches and give occasional media interviews. And I suppose it was remiss of me not to welcome members of the media here tonight at the start, but can I underline and stress the point about occasional media interviews? It's why I've declassified operations and case studies to give you a clearer picture of the threats we face. None of that was easy. Some of that was controversial, but all of it was important. Transparency matters, and transparency is a precursor for trust. My thinking on transparency crystallised at a time in my career when in the Defence Signals Directorate it was accused of an illegal act. The allegations were completely unfounded and proven to be unfounded by an Inspector General of Intelligence Security, but the damage was done, reputation stained, and confidence bruised. That affair taught me how difficult it can be for a secret organisation to defend itself even when it's done nothing wrong. It's assumed if you're in the shadows, you must be shadowy. But we can dispel that with sunlight by explaining who we are, what we do, and why we matter. Not long after that incident, a journalist put a salacious and inaccurate claim to a certain intelligence agency I'm not going to say which one or even in which country. But instead of saying, that's ridiculous or hell no, which certainly would have been my response, the Brains Trust replied with no comment, and that's off the record. The story got published the next day, and there was much head shaking and tut tutting as spy chiefs wondered how the newspaper could get it so wrong. Well, the journalist got it so wrong because the agency ignored an opportunity to make it right. Now, obviously, there are things a spy agency cannot talk about, especially one where human sources and technical capabilities are critical to its success. We need to be able to do things our adversaries think are impossible. But as I rose through the ranks, it became clear there was much more that we can say than no comment. We don't talk about our operations, but we can reveal their outcomes. We must be secretive about our capabilities, but we can be open about our values. We cannot identify our undeclared staff, but we can celebrate the difference they make. So that brings me to my second principle of my transparency push, ASIO's people. Transparency is a powerful recruitment tool. People won't work for an agency if they don't know what it does and what it values and they can't apply for a job that they don't know exists. I want more people to choose ASIO, and I want ASIO to choose more people from diverse backgrounds. That's a challenge all intelligence agencies around the world are grappling with. 
We need to do better and we must reflect the community we protect. So it's never too early to start planning a career in ASIO. In fact, I recently received an excellent letter from a seven-year-old Ava who wanted to be a surveillance officer. She told me she's good at spying because she's little and nobody sees her. <laughs> Ava even volunteered her mum to drive her around on surveillance shifts. <laughs> we so want to give her a job. Ava clearly possesses some skills that we're looking for. She's creative, she shows initiative, and she can communicate. But hide and seek isn't just for kids, and surveillance isn't just hide and seek. So none of you be surprised, we're hiring for surveillance officers right now. And while surveillance is a traditional spy role, we have many other roles that we're advertising right now, or about to advertise, that are not usually associated with a spy agency, but are integral to our success. Trade professions such as electricians and plumbers, technology graduates who can design, build and deliver systems, access data and help our analysts make sense of data, business analysts and project managers to drive an uplift in our capability, intelligence officers and analysts to collect the dots and connect the dots, and legal graduates to ensure our covert operations are lawful and as well to work on litigation and other corporate matters. So there is no ASIO type. We need people from all walks of life, and I invite you to find your fit. So that's what an annual threat assessment is, delivers for ASIO. The final and perhaps most important factor is what's in it for you, ASIO's partners and stakeholders. It's critically important to explain the threats we are seeing so you are armed with awareness and the advice so you need, that you need to counter those threats. Security is a shared responsibility. ASIO can't stop every terrorist and catch every spy. The scale, persistence and sophistication the threats Australia is facing demands a broader approach to security. I'll return to this later. Australia's security environment remains complex, challenging and changing. COVID-19 and associated lockdowns are adding considerable volatility to the mix. And while thankfully the time of lockdown seems to have come to an end, the impacts of those lockdowns are continuing to influence our security environment. We all spent a lot more time online during the pandemic, and this was a positive in many respects. During difficult times, we were able to maintain connections with family and friends, allowed many of you to work from home, and of course, enabled plenty of online shopping. But like many things online, for every benefit the internet delivered, a related downside was created. More online shopping meant more cybercrime. More online engagement provided greater opportunities for radicalisation. More working from home enabled or increased the risk of cyber-enabled espionage. I'd like to delve into these last two a little more because they fall squarely within ASIO's remit. And they are exerting significant influence on our security environment. In the last two years, thousands of Australians with access to sensitive information have been targeted by foreign spies using social media profiles. These spies are adept at selecting and using the internet for their recruitment efforts. On any of the popular social media or internet platforms, they make seemingly innocuous approaches, such as a job offer. They then progress this to direct messaging or different encrypted platforms, or in-person meetings before a recruitment pitch is made. I've previously highlighted our concerns about approaches on professional networking sites, but during the pandemic, we've seen this threat spread. There's been a jump in suspicious approaches on messages platforms like WhatsApp, for example. It's easy for a foreign intelligence service to target employees of interest. We're also seeing suspicious approaches on dating platforms such as Tinder, Bumble and Hinge. And my message for any potential victim on these sites is a familiar one. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. While espionage is one of the most insidious threats we are dealing with online, it's not our most concerning trend. The internet is the world's single most potent and powerful incubator of extremism. Online radicalisation online radicalization is nothing new, but COVID sent that into overdrive. 
Isolated individuals spent more time online exposed to extremist messaging, misinformation and conspiracy theories. Social media platforms, chat rooms and algorithms are designed to join us up with people who share our views and push to the material they will like. It's like being an echo chamber where the echo gets louder and louder, generating cycles of exposure and reinforcement. More time in those online environments without some of the circuit breakers of everyday life, like family and community engagement, work and school, created more extremists. And in some cases, it accelerated the progression on the radicalisation pathway towards violence. Back in 2007, ASIO produced an assessment warning of the implications of a pandemic. We did that not because we're health experts, but it's our job to identify and analyse phenomena that might have security impacts on it for our country. We assessed a pandemic would result in an increase in anti-government behaviour. And we've certainly seen that with COVID. While ASIO's overall terrorism caseload has decreased since this time last year, there's been a distinct increase in radicalisation and specific issue grievances. Some Australians believe the government's approach to vaccines and lockdowns infringed their freedoms. And in a small number of cases, grievance turned to violence. Obvious examples are the violent incidents at COVID-related protests fueled by anti-vaccine, anti-lockdown and anti-government agendas. We've also seen threats against public office holders, an attack on a vaccination clinic and several physical assaults of healthcare workers. We assess these tensions and the associated possibility of violence will persist. While lockdowns, lockdowns and mandatory quarantine requirements are being eased, the introduction of vaccine requirements for some forms of employment, social engagement and travel will continue to drive anger, uncertainty and fear in a small section of our society. This cohort views the restrictions as a, res a restriction of their rights, a creation of a two-tier society and confirmation of their perceived persecution. To be clear, ASIO does not have any issue with people who have opinions they want to express. That's a critical part of a vibrant democracy. We do not and cannot investigate peaceful protest or dissent. Our concern is where opinions tip to violence or the actual acts of violence. And I should stress the vast majority of people who choose not to be vaccinated will not engage in violence in response to vaccine mandates. The vast majority of protesters are not violent extremists, and the vast majority of protests are not violent. ASIO's focus is on a small number of angry and alienated Australians. This is precisely why the concern I identified in my speech last year, and precisely why we changed our language we used to describe violent extremism. As I warned back then, we're seeing a growing number of individuals and groups that don't fit left-right spectrum at all. Instead, they're motivated by a fear of societal collapse, a specific social or economic grievance or conspiracy. The behaviours we're seeing in response to COVID lockdowns and vaccines are not specifically left or right wing. They're a cocktail of views, fears, frustrations and conspiracies. Individuals who hold these views and are willing to support violence to further them are best and most accurately described as ideologically motivated violent extremists. Some of the alleged act, violent acts at the recent old Parliament House protest are a case in point. The individuals involved were driven by a diverse range of grievances, including anti-vaccination agendas, conspiracy theories and anti-government sovereign citizen beliefs. Assigning the protest to a specific point on a political spectrum is neither accurate nor helpful. Of course, this doesn't mean that people who hold, say, racist and nationalist views participate in these activities. Sometimes they do. But they're just a relatively small part of a much wider and looser group. And this is an important point to make because we expect to see this behaviour continue in Australia in the medium term. Protest driven by specific issue grievances will be part of our security environment for the foreseeable future. In some cases, protesters will advocate the use of violence. In a small number of cases, they may well use violence. In this uptick in specific issue or grievance motivated violent extremism, 
many of the actors or new, are newcomers, so it's really difficult for us to get a sense of what is simply big talk and what is genuine planning for violence. Making the call about which statements indicate a genuine plan for violence and on which purely are sounding off or wishful thinking is one of the greatest challenges my analysts face. Our information is also often incomplete and the stakes are high. Every judgment an analyst makes affects another. When they decide to continue an investigation, they are in effect deciding not to continue or start a new one. With finite resources, this is a zero sum game. The most likely terrorist attack scenario in Australia over the next 12 months continues to be a lone actor attack and that fact weighs heavily on my mind and the minds of my staff. And while there was no terrorist attacks domestically last year, there were two major disruptions of violent extremist attacks. Globally, violent extremist attacks remain a frequent occurrence and the transnational nature of terrorism means that events in distant places, such as the fall of the government in Afghanistan, can reverberate closer to home. We're monitoring this carefully. And while we do not assess that it has increased the immediate threat in Australia, we remain concerned that in the longer term, violent extremists from our region will travel to Afghanistan for militant training. Two years ago, in my threat, first threat assessment, I noted ASIO was seeing an increase in the radicalisation of young Australians. Unfortunately and alarmingly, this trend is continuing. The number of minors being radicalised is getting higher and the age of minors being radicalised is getting lower. Most of that radicalisation occurs online, reflecting the dynamic I raised earlier. But some of it also happens in person, face to face. Children as young as 13 are now embracing extremism, and that's happening with religiously motivated violent extremism and ideologically motivated violent extremism. And unlike past experience, many of these young people do not come from families where a parent or sibling already holds extreme views. As the Director General of Security, this trend is deeply concerning. As a parent, this trend is deeply distressing. As a nation, we need to reflect on why some of our teenagers are hanging Nazi flags and portraits of the Christchurch killer on their bedroom walls, and why others are sharing beheading videos. And just importantly, we must reflect on what we can do about it. A few years ago, miners represented around 2 to 3% of our new counter-terrorism investigations. In the last year, though, that figure has been close to 15%. And perhaps more disturbingly, these young people are more intense in their extremism. Where once minors were on the fringe of extremism, they tended to be on the fringe, we now see teenagers in leadership positions, directing adults and willing to undertake violent act themselves. At the end of last year, on average, minors represented more than half our priority counter-terrorism investigations each week. This should concern us all. Let me repeat that. Miners made up 15% of our new counterterrorism investigations and more than half of our highest priority investigations each week. ASIO is aware of miners preying on other miners, seeking to turn them to their violent ideology and using grooming techniques similar to those used by pedophiles. We've seen young individuals radicalise violent extremists, systematically targeting vulnerable associates who are lonely or going through tough times. Targeting took place online and face-to-face -face in a variety of settings, even schools. The tactics used by the extremists in these cases involved a combination of attention, flattery and friendship, which then shifted to bullying and manipulation. We've seen young ringleaders deliberately desensitise their targets, gradually exposing them to more extreme, more violent propaganda until even the most horrific material imaginable was normalised. And believe me when I tell you, ASIA finds these kinds of cases challenging. We don't belong in the schoolyard. And while we'll act when there's a threat of violence, violence the broader trend of teen teen teenage radicalisation demands a different response. One where I'd suggest ASIO and law enforcement should not be the answer. It's very hard to de-radicalise an adult but there are many more options to redirect young people who are experimenting with extremism in response to unhappiness or insecurity. 
As a society, we have to recognise the signs and step in early. Radicalisation in young people can happen quickly, in days and weeks, not months and years. And, most, and the kids most vulnerable are when they're under stress. In those situations, ASIO's role is at the end, at the point where there's an active threat to security. But before this point, there are nearly always off-ramps, opportunities to redirect behaviour. Government, of course, plays a key role in helping countering violent extremism. Our colleagues in policy agencies, law enforcement and community organisations are doing important and great work in this space. But the community can play a pivotal role in identifying signs that a teenager isn't just going through adolescence, but is heading towards radicalisation. But without knowing these indicators, it's much harder for us to divert them from their dangerous path. Schools and sport clubs should notice and ask questions if the young people you know are acting antisocially or out of character. Parents and carers should notice and ask questions if young children are receiving or circulating inappropriate material online. Children often start with moderately objectionable material, which then becomes worse and worse. Identifying it early can be critical. And of course, community leaders should notice and ask questions if young people you know are showing a marked demeanour change or in their change of views. Security is a shared responsibility. While threat to life will always be a priority for ASIO, our attention and resourcing is increasingly being directed towards threats to Australia's way of life. The first and most perhaps significant thing to say is that espionage and foreign interference has now supplanted terrorism as the most secure, serious security threat facing Australia. And this is not to downplay the significance of terrorism. In terms of scale and sophistication though, espionage and foreign interference threats are outpacing terrorism threats and therefore demand more attention and more resources. The threat is pervasive, multifaceted and if left unchecked, can do serious damage to our sovereignty, values and national interest. Multiple countries are seeking to conduct espionage against us and not just those countries that you might consider our traditional adversaries. In some instances, it is conducted by countries we consider friends. Friends with sharp elbows and voracious intelligence requirements. But for decades, foreign spies have been seeking information about Australia's strategic capabilities, economic and policy priorities, our world-class research and development and defence technologies. Obviously, the capabilities and decision-making around AUKUS fall squarely into that category. Foreign intelligence agencies would already have added them to their collection requirements, just as ASIO is already working to thwart them. But that should surprise no one. But it is one of the reasons I'm flagging a more attractive approach to our security advice and engagement. Following my address last year, our disruption of a nest of spies got a lot of attention. But dismantling spy networks is business as usual for ASIO, and we did it again last year. Over a series of months, we painstakingly mapped out a foreign intelligence service's onshore network of sources and contacts. And then we picked it apart. Australians who were targeted by this foreign intelligence service included current and former high-ranking government officials, academics, members of think tanks, business executives, and members of the diaspora community. When we interviewed members of the network, some of them suspected they would engage with spies but most had no idea and were shocked when we knocked on their doors. As a sting in the tail, we've removed the spies and we've laid tripwires just in case this foreign country ever tries to reactivate this network. But this was just one of a number of disruptions we undertook in the past 12 months. As well as espionage, we're seeing an increase in foreign interference. And I want to take a moment to draw this out in particular, the difference between foreign interference and foreign influence. The confusion about legitimate, where legitimate influence stops and starts is understandable. We see our targets engaging in both, and foreign interference is clandestine and therefore difficult to discern. Publicly praising a regime, even an odious one, is not interference. Transparently lobbying on behalf of a foreign government is not interference. Diplomacy is not interference. These things are routine acts of statecraft, 
but any or all of these can become acts of foreign interference if they involve the hidden hand of a foreign state and are contrary to our country's interests. If the person publicly praising another country is doing so because they've received discreet instructions from a foreign government, it could constitute foreign interference if it's detrimental to our interests and done to affect our political processes. So what does foreign interference look like in practice? There are two uh, main manifestations I'd like to focus on. One is the harassment of Australia's diaspora community. This is something we've been warning about for some time. Foreign governments will often monitor and intimidate members of diaspora communities who are critics of their government or express views which odds with the regime's policies. It's unacceptable that people who live in your street and mine are subject to the strong arm and the long arm of a foreign state. Again, it's important to understand exactly what is and what is not foreign interference just in this context. Because just as it's perfectly legal in our country to criticise a foreign regime, it's perfectly legal to stage a counter-protest. This is not necessarily foreign interference, it might just be nationalist zeal. But if a foreign government is clandestinely directing the counter-protest, then my organisation will be very interested. Some of the governments we've dealt with seem to think this sort of community harassment is okay. They're wrong. It's not okay. One of the most insidious things about foreign interference is it uses our strengths against us. The perpetrators exploit our values, freedoms and trust to undermine our values, freedoms and trust. Foreign interference in our political system is a case in point. The governments, and I must emphasise governments involved in these activities, take advantage of the open and accountable nature of our political system. Attempts at political interference are not confined to one side of politics, and you'd be surprised by the range of countries involved. It's also important I put this into context. While attempts to interfere in our democratic processes are common, successful interference is not. Our democracy remains robust, our parliaments remain sovereign, our elections remain free, and the overwhelming majority of politicians remain thoroughly resistant to even the most sophisticated and subtle approaches. It's critical we don't let the fear of foreign interference undermine stakeholder engagement or stoke community division. Were this to happen, it would perversely have the same corrosive impact on our democracy as foreign interference itself. This year, a federal election year, we need to be particularly on guard against foreign political interference. I can confirm that ASIO recently detected and disrupted a foreign interference plot in the lead up to an election in Australia. I'm not going to identify the jurisdiction because we're seeing attempts at foreign interference at all levels of government in all states and territories. But it's important to explain what political interference actually looked like. This case involved a wealthy individual who maintained direct and deep connections with a foreign government and its intelligence agencies. The agent of interference in this case has roots in Australia, but did the bidding of offshore masters, knowingly and covertly seeking to advance the interests of a foreign power and in the process undermine Australia's sovereignty. I'll call this person the puppeteer, although it's important to note that while the puppeteer pulled the strings, the foreign government pulled the shots or called the shots. The puppeteer hired a person to enable foreign interference operations and used an offshore bank account to provide hundreds of thousands of dollars for operating expenses, secretly shaping the jurisdiction's political scene to the benefit of a foreign power was a key performance indicator. It was like a foreign interference startup. The employer hired by the puppeteer began identifying candidates likely to run in the election who either supported the interests of the foreign government or who were assessed as vulnerable to inducements and cultivation. The employer used existing relationships with politicians, staffers and journalists to select potential targets without revealing the secret intent, the foreign connection or the puppeteer's involvement. The puppeteer and the employee plotted ways of advancing candidates' political prospects through generous support, placing favourable stories in foreign language news platforms and providing other forms of assistance. They investigated hiring political consultants, advertising agencies and PR specialists to help individual campaigns. The aim was not just to get the candidates into a position of power, but also to generate a sense of appreciation, obligation and indebtedness. 
that could obviously be exploited at the right time. The political candidates in this case had no knowledge of the plot, and even if their plan had proceeded, they would not have known who were pulling the strings. The puppeteer used the employee as a cutout. This deliberate deceit and secrecy about the foreign government connection is what took this case into the realm of foreign interference. At this point, ASIO acted. Our intervention ensured the plan was not executed and harm was avoided. Now, it's impossible to know what, exactly how this would have happened or what would have happened if this disruption didn't occur. But let me offer you an informed scenario. Some of the candidates get elected. The puppeteer's employee then recommends they hire certain other associates as political staffers. These people are also agents or proxies of the foreign government and will try to influence the politician, shape decision making and help identify other political figures who can be influenced and recruited. Down the track, new parliamentarians might be asked for information about a party's position on a certain policy, defence policy, human rights or foreign investment or trade. This information will find its way back to the foreign power without the knowledge of the parliamentarian. At some point, the politician might be prevailed upon to vote a particular way on a contentious issue or lobby other colleagues to vote a certain way. I know how that would play out because we've seen it happen in cases where unfortunately we've uncovered foreign interference at a later stage. And these cases are much more serious. This is why our role is crucial. It's why our role and the role of our partners and in particular the Australian Federal Police use a suite of measures to disrupt foreign interference plots. The tools include defensive briefings to potential victims, interview to, interviews of perpetrators and other targeted intelligence activities, visa cancellations if we're dealing with foreign nationals and of course law enforcement action. The first and most effective defence against all forms of foreign interference is awareness. Know who you're dealing with and know why. That's why I've given you a level of detail tonight we would not normally reveal in public. I want to improve your understanding of what foreign interference is and just as importantly, what it is not. The case study I've described makes it clear that foreign interference in our political system is far removed from lobbying, diplomacy or other open and transparent attempts to influence decision making. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't want misunderstandings about foreign interference to undermine democratic processes, community engagement or our multicultural society, which I firmly believe is a national asset. The perpetrators of foreign interference carefully hide their true motivations. But that does not mean politicians are powerless to protect themselves. The instincts and values and transparency that guide other elements of political engagement are powerful shields against foreign interference. If a supporter wants to provide significant levels of assistance or install a certain staffer in your office, do your due diligence. If a business operator wants to donate significant resources to your campaign, ask what's in it for them. If a media proprietor promises unlimited positive coverage, query their motives. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting people should reflexively turn down these types of assistance. Just you should be aware of the risks they pose, pose the appropriate questions and be transparent and accountable for what's received. And most critically, stay alert to backers calling in their favours by asking for something that conflicts with Australia's interests. Security is a shared responsibility. And that's the message I want to leave you with tonight. I want to assure you of two things. Good security is achievable and good security works. I find it infuriating when companies say they've been done over by an adversary so powerful there was no way to defend against it. That's what I call the Borg defence. Resistance is futile. In my experience, resistance is rarely futile. Certainly in the cyber field, the overwhelming majority of compromises are foreseeable and avoidable. While some of these are seriously damaging, many others that are breathlessly called cyber attacks in the media and by other commentators are not compromises at all. They're reconnaissance missions. If a digital doors are locked, the intruder will move on. At the same time, I'm the first to admit ASIO is not all seeing and all knowing. And we don't want to be, and while ASIO is a part of the answer to the challenges I've outlined, we're not the whole answer. The acceleration of radicalisation, online propaganda and misinformation, single issue extremism 
and miners embracing violent extreme, extremism all require a whole of government, whole of system and whole of nation approach. And that's why teamwork is critical. Our work with law enforcement, the national intelligence community, home affairs and our international counterparts is well known. All of you are represented in this room tonight and I want to thank you and commend you for being such effective mission enablers, leaders and force multipliers. But ASIO can do more. The scale and scope of Australia's adversary requires a different approach and a broader approach to security intelligence, its influence and our impact. The threat environment demands we take our engagement to a new strategic level. It's what we call hardening the environment, making our economy, institutions and political systems more difficult and resilient targets for those seeking to undermine them. I started this address with a personal mission, so I might as well conclude with one too. The Director General of Security is not always the most welcome visitor. In fact, that's always the case. All too often when I knock on the door, the person who opens the door looks like they're thinking, uh-oh, here comes bad news. Or as my staff say, here's the bad news bear. Obviously, ASIO will continue to identify and communicate the threats we see. But I want to put more emphasis on what you can do about them, how you can protect your people, places, technology and information, how a good security strategy addresses physical security, IT security and personnel security. And as I've said before, security is achievable and good security works. The threats Australia is facing are serious, but not insurmountable. Our adversaries are sophisticated, but not unstoppable. In all the case studies I presented this evening, the online radicalisers, the teenage extremists, the nation state conducting political interference, in all of them, the adversary made a mistake that brought it to ASIO's attention and led to the threat being mitigated. And just in case our adversaries are listening, I should point out that you don't need to make a mistake to come to our attention. ASIO can catch you even if your tradecraft is perfect. I'll back my people any day. We'll continue to play our part. We will protect Australia's security and safeguard its sovereignty. We will detect and defeat Australia's adversaries and we'll work with you to defend our nation's interests. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>